COP28 rolls into town next week, and that's why we here at DXB today are celebrating in style. How? A bit of a sort of sustainability lifestyle special with a nod to COP28. So we've been talking about it, how you can change your life and your lifestyle to become more sustainable. Now we're going to look at it from more specific areas, if you like. What about the areas of nature? What about the areas of the indigenous surroundings, be they coastal or otherwise here? Well, who better to ask than the team from Emirates Nature WWF? The head of climate at Emirates Nature WWF is Nadia Rushdie, who is our next guest here on the sofa. Thanks so much indeed for being with us. Thanks for having me. And a, thanks for being with us. B, thanks for being us at what must be the busiest <laughs> time of year for you. Head of Climate at Emirates Nature, WWF, COP28 knocking on the door at the moment. Tell us about your involvement, first and foremost, in the big event. Perfect, yeah, no, thank you for having me. And uh, it is an incredibly busy time, but we have an amazing team at Emirates Nature uh, that work across all the key priority areas. So we have our nature teams, our agroecology teams. So, so it's, it's obviously a bigger team than just me, but. Um, essentially, we are the WWF office for the UAE, mm. right? So the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Uh, we are an official observer of the UNFCCC, so we're one of the key constituencies. So, you know, when we talk about COP28, we have to remember also this is negotiated elements that we're talking about mm. at COP28 under the climate regime, under international law. So um, we very much engage with our WWF network. We have over 90 offices in the world. We're the host office and the national office for the COP28. Um, but very much using it as an opportunity also to highlight the domestic projects that we've had. We've been here for 23 years working on nature and climate. We have great insights and expertise that all based on science that we also want to elevate to that global level to use domestic portfolio examples to really showcase how nature and climate can be used mm. as a tool to tackle the climate crisis. So Nadia, when it comes to actually conserving the, the nation's natural heritage, what does that really mean? What does that include? I mean, it, it includes a variety of habitats and biodiversity, right? So we have certain projects that pick up um, on certain key seascapes, for example. Uh, we work in Abu Dhabi and Al Bitna, um, uh, sorry, Abu Dhabi and uh, seascapes. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about prioritizing nature, restoring nature, and also s identifying the tools that it can also bring in terms of having climate positive outcomes, right? Um, uh, carbon sinks like mangroves, etc. And I think at the end of the day, it's really about making sure that what we do is nature positive and climate positive, but also that supports resilient communities. Mm. Um, going back to COP28, um, are you going to be present in the green zone? And if so, how can the public get involved with what you're doing? How can they learn um, about the project? Is, is, is COP going to become what zone are you in? You know, is it, oh, is it, it is, is already. Is it a zone off oh, already? Is a zone is it? If you got blue, everyone's got blue. Have you got green? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it might be a zone off, but I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> look, the great thing about this COP also is that there's going to be massive engagement from the private sector, right? So green zone, whether you're green zone or blue zone, you have an opportunity to engage. Um, I think the, the beauty also of the, the Green Zone is that local communities, youth, I mean, regular people can engage, right? And I think this is the opportunity to also understand what is a COP. I think to your point, Absolutely. right? What are we coming and talking about? I think we often forget about that. So if I just take a step back, we're talking about negotiators at a party level, at the country level, coming and negotiating how are they going to deliver the world to be under the 1.5 threshold target that we've deemed as you know the safe limit for climate warming right how are we going to do that at a global level it's a global issue mm. that requires national parties to come together and negotiate how they're going to deliver the paris agreement right remember that paris mm. agreement at cop 21 remember it well yeah how are we going to achieve 1.5 degree of warming and limit it to that and how are we going to adapt to the changes of climate how are we going to finance you know decarbonization. So think about this as the nucleus of COP is about the negotiated outcomes that we talk about formally under this international climate regime. That is the nucleus and negotiators are coming from all around the world to do this at COP28 for the first time in the UAE yeah. and after that it'll move to other countries like we've seen in the past. Yeah. This is the core of it but at the same time bringing all these negotiators together and all these experts together is also a great opportunity to showcase examples, collaboration, partnerships that are driving action and implementation on climate and nature, but also on gender and youth and really the kind of intersection between that. 
So I think there is a blue zone conversation <laughs> about the negotiations and the negotiators going to that, um, but also very much how are we going to use this as an opportunity to scale up domestic action on climate and I'll also say nature because mm -hmm. of our role. Yeah. Um, and how are we going to make sure that the COP28 legacy after COP leaves is strong, that we see scaled up domestic action across private sector, youth, indigenous communities, or, um, our local populations, and how are we going to scale those partnerships, not only domestically, but across the GCC yeah. and, and, and otherwise. So and it's fascinating, because like you said, we keep talking about the legacy and what's going to happen after COP, or we were just going to go back to normal, so it's, it's interesting. Um, I wish we had more time with you, we don't, but before we let you go, like, how can people get in touch with you and get involved with you and your projects, be it COP28 or otherwise? We have amazing programs, so for example, our Leaders of Change program is really about mobilizing youth in the community um, to really push forward on citizen science examples. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think for COP28, come to COP28, there is, you know, day passes are fully free and available. It's all going to be on the expo site. For example, we were hosting an escape room called the Ma Mangrove Edition Escape Room that really shows the science behind climate change adaptation in a really tangible way. So come and visit our, our, our escape room in the green zone, but also attend events, meet people, and really try to understand this kind of, we have this global issue on climate change, but the solutions really are domestic and are really within our hands. Amazing. So it's all about engaging and learning and really identifying what 2024 is gonna look like uh, here in the UAE so that we can advance on uh, decarbonizing and mitigating climate change. Which zone are you in? Both. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Don't mess with Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be a little bit everywhere uh, all at once. <laughs> well, Nadia, thank you so much for being here right now and telling us a little bit more about this. Uh, please come and see us anytime you like. Thank right. you. <laughs> thank you for having me. It is now just about one week before COP28 kicks off. So we asked Dubai-based startups and entrepreneurs to find out what COP28 means for them. Let's take a look. My name is Wilhelm Hedberg. I am the founder of eCar. It's the Middle East's first and largest personal mobility company. I'm the founder of The Hair Addict, and it's a company that encourages all women to love themselves and not to leave their hair natural. So Luxury Promise is a global resale platform where we are offering a venue to buy, sell, and exchange your luxury goods. Uh, Revive is a marketplace for refurbished electronics. COP28 is a massively important event in Dubai, and what I view is, is personally uh, something that um, sparks um, a lot of interest uh, with me is the fact that it, it really revolves around sustainability and sustainable businesses. We're very excited about the UAE hosting COP28. You see, the Hair Addict is all about sustainability. So I established this company, in fact, to encourage people and users to use sustainable and healthier hair care routine for their hair, not only via using products with less chemicals and not only using path mat that is eco-friendly, but also by using hair care tools that are eco-friendly and recyclable. At Luxury Promise, our core ethos is to be sustainable, is to be mindful about the impact we are leaving on the environment. So I think it's a great um, you know, initiative that Dubai has taken and is continuously taking um, to you know, limit and reduce our carbon footprint and to be more sustainable. I, I think it's a great opportunity for anyone contributing to the circular economy like us. I think the more awareness there are on those topics, uh, the more people will understand the benefits of a uh, business like ours. So actually, we believe that COP28 goes in line with our vision. And we believe that by showcasing our work there, not only we will raise awareness and make people aware of the efforts that we have been doing, but we will role model to other companies in the hair care business to do the same as well. One of the core pieces of my um, interest of getting into car sharing um, with e uh, building eCar was this sustainable approach to, to car sharing, meaning for every one car that's shared, it's 10 owned cars off the road. So sustainability has a big impact on me. There's a lot of entrepreneurs in the ecosystem that are looking at sustainable businesses and seeing opportunities in, in this space. And I think COP28 is an absolutely phenomenal way for these types of entrepreneurs to find one location to meet and discuss new and fresh ideas. It's really interesting to see what everyone is doing all around COP28. Right, it is that time. It is time for the Daily Roundup. Ash, what's going on? 
So glad you asked, Katie. The 12th season of the Hamdan bin Mohammed bin Rashid International Photography Award, HIPAA, took place on the 16th of November. Massimo Giorgetta from Italy won the HIPAA Grand Prize of uh, 120,000 US dollars presented by Sheikh Mansour bin Mohammed bin Rashid. Massimo documented a mysterious sea creature from the jellyfish family. Um, I don't know about you guys, my photography skills are limited <laughs> to Instagram, but this is such an interesting annual event. It was founded in 2011 yeah. and it has become one of the most coveted photography awards across the world, not just for professionals, but for also amateur mm. photographers. How would you describe your photography skills, Tom? I have none. Not as good as Massimo. <laughs> but have you seen the image though? It's absolutely fascinating. It's this jellyfish is almost like completely, uh, what's the word? Transparent is the word I was going for. And it's actually got other sort of marine life inside it. It looks like an animation. It's fascinating. It's, it's yeah, because it's one of those sort of secrets of the deep, isn't yes. it? You know? So there's two reasons that the, I would not be taking a photo yeah. like that. One, it's underwater. Yeah. Uh, and only <laughs> scary monsters like that should yeah. be underwater. Um, and the other was, uh, it, yeah, it's, but it, it is. It's almost alien in, in, in its sort of perceivable. Oh, wow. Here are, we're just showing it to everyone at the moment. And as you say, that don't look like a photo. That right? looks like. That's actually marine life inside a jellyfish. I'm glad he won. For sure. Congratulations. $120,000 definitely worth it. Yeah. I bet, Tom, all the pictures you have in your phone are of the parking spots in the mall. This is quite true, actually. <laughs> and you your know kids, me, maybe. You know me far too well. <laughs> no, more, more parking, parking spots. I, I just enjoy going through your phone when you're not looking. Oh, that's all right, all. okay. <laughs> well, could find some interesting stuff, that's for sure. And uh, are you a photography uh, enthusiast? I absolutely love photography. I, I definitely couldn't take something of, of that standard, unfortunately. But it is really interesting to see what lurks beyond in right. the deep. There are lots of crazy creatures down there. <laughs> but um, good on him. Well deserved. I mean, just in keeping in, in context of, of what we're talking about here, I think competitions like this, and especially, you know, when you're addressing sea life under under the uh, uh, under the water and and other, I mean you've mentioned a number of you know the animals and using great photography mm. to to shine a light on an issue of sustainability can be a real uh, a bonus in an event like this yeah Absolutely. Photography is an extremely powerful tool to try and raise awareness of critical issues around the world um, with all animals and with conservation issues in particular. Yeah, great to see uh, so many different initiatives sort of driving that message uh, towards how we can live more sustainable lives. In fact, more advice coming from Anthea and the rest of the team in just a few moments' time. Let's see what's remaining coming up. Faris headed down to Wetex, which is just getting bigger and bigger every single year. We'll find out much more a little bit later. And we find out how health, well-being and sustainability can be key to good interior design. Plus, we're also going to have a workout right here in studio. So don't go anywhere.